and welcome to Tullahoma Parks and Recreation TV. This is a new outdoor series that we're going to be doing eight episodes for. This is episode number one. And over this series, we're gonna cover the seven principles of Leave No Trace, and also cover an overview of all seven, along with a pack breakdown for a day hike of my personal gear. If I were leading a hike, or if I was just going on one by myself, I'll show you everything that I have in the bag and the reason why that I carry it. We're also going to cover an easy way to remember all seven principles of Leave No Trace. Sometimes it's easy to remember lists if you have hand signals to go along with it. So if you have young viewers out there, they're really going to enjoy this part. So I'll show you that here in just a few moments. But first, I want to take you through a segment on some of the history behind outdoor ethics and the codes that we follow here in the United States to keep our waters and our skies and our lands as clean as possible. America's Conservation Pledge had its origin in a national competition with $5,000 in prizes sponsored by Outdoor Life magazine in 1946. More than 15,000 entries were received, an amazing response in view of the fact that each person who submitted a pledge was also required to write an essay on the necessity for conservation. The pledge read, I give my pledge as an American to save and faithfully to defend from waste the natural resources of my country, its soil and minerals, its forests, waters, and wildlife. The winning pledge was submitted by L.L. L. Foreman of Santa Fe, New Mexico. Then on December 7, 1946, at a public ceremony in Washington, the conservation pledge was presented to the nation. Immediately thereafter, the pledge was adopted and put to use all over the country by state agencies, and primarily in schools. It was also put into use among youth organizations such as Boy and Girl Scout groups, Campfire Girls, 4-H clubs, different sportsmen's clubs, hundreds of which adopted the pledge as their official doctrine, and by state and federal agencies, most notably the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the U.S. Department of the Interior. The Outdoor Code first appeared in Boys Life magazine in the March 1954 issue, which featured an outdoor code for Americans. This effort was prompted by a request from Dwight Eisenhower challenging the Boy Scouts to raise public awareness of the importance of caring for natural resources. The oath read, As an American, I will do my best to be clean in my outdoor manners, to be careful with fire, to be considerate in the outdoors, and be conservation-minded. Then in 1987, a no-trace program was formed for wilderness and backcountry travel, the U.S. Forest Service, the National Park Service, and Bureau of Land Management distributed a pamphlet entitled Leave No Trace Land Ethics. In the early 90s, the National Outdoor Leadership School was enlisted to develop a hands-on, science-based, and minimum impact education training for non-motorized recreational activity. Then in 1993, an outdoor rec summit with land management agencies and members of the outdoor industry convened in Washington to form an independent Leave No Trace organization. Today, the organization reaches over 15 million Americans in dozens of countries with conservation initiatives, education, training, research, and outreach. Now I'm going to show you an easy way to remember all seven principles using simple hand gestures. It's really easy, so if everybody's watching, follow along. Here we go. Principle number one. Take your pointer finger and point it up. Principle one is think and plan ahead. So think and plan ahead. Think about what you're going to do. Write out your plan. That's principle number one. Principle number two. Make your little finger man like this. And you're going to put out your arm. Your arm is the trail. Finger man is going to Number two, travel and camp on durable surfaces. So he just walks down your trail, camps right there on your hand. Travel and camp on durable surfaces. That's number two. Here's number three. So what you're gonna do is put your three fingers together like this and it makes what looks like a scoop or a shovel. So you can put all three fingers together. You can use either hand, it doesn't matter. 
Number three is dispose of waste properly. So this is your little shovel. You're going to dig in and scoop out with your shovel. That's number three. And when we get into each principle, we're going to explain what each one of these hand signals mean and some deep dive on some of the information that each one covers. Principle number four. So you're gonna take your thumbs and your fingers. So you got four fingers here, right? Turn them this way into a camera, all right? Principle number four is leave what you find. And this is a picture. You can take all the pictures you want, but we ask that you please don't take anything out of nature. All right, number five, all five fingers on one hand, you can pick any hand you want to, turn it around this way. Number five is be careful with fire. So you're gonna make your fire ring here and all five fingers are your flames. So this is number five, be careful with fire. Number six, this is a fun one, then make sure you get the camera out to do this one. Number six, all three fingers, I'm sorry, I have a hand injury, I can't close this hand very well, very well but take all three fingers like this, respect wildlife. These are your wildlife fingers. All right, those are your antlers. So respect wildlife, number six. That one's gonna be really fun. I've got some really good information to share with you when we get to that episode. And the last one, um, principle number seven, two fingers on one hand, all five fingers on the other. You're given the peace sign and you're waving. Number seven is be considerate of other visitors. You don't want to disturb them, so leave them in peace. Wave and wish them well or say hello. And that's it. That's all seven of them. So let's go through them again. Principle number one, think, plan ahead. Number two, travel, camp on durable surfaces. Number three, make your scoop, dig in, dig out, dispose of waste properly. That's number three. Number four, all four fingers, Take pictures, leave what you find, but you can take all the pictures that you want. All right, number five, all five fingers on one hand, make your fire ring and your hand becomes the fire. All right, number six, antlers. Be respectful of wildlife. This is the fun one. They're gonna make fun of me here at work for doing this. Respect wildlife. And number seven, be considerate of other visitors. Let's go back to the table and we'll cover now what are the essentials that go in your pack. All right, so now I'm gonna take you through one of my gear packs that I would take on a day hike. Um, let's just say for this purpose, uh, we're taking a day hike up to Short Springs. We're gonna do about six miles uh, around the Adams Falls Trail. Uh, we're gonna stop at, um, at the Wildflower Loop and we're gonna stop at Machine Falls and take in all the sites. And so this is what I would have with me just on a general day hike. Now, uh, different organizations have adopted this list of what they call the, the 10, 10, let me get my hands in there, 10 essentials that everybody should have in their pack. Um, but you have to remember, I think that your pack is going to be determined almost more by where you're going and what you're going to do when you get there. This is part of the number one, think and plan ahead. So if you know where you're going and what you want to do when you get there, so what did I say? We're going to go to the falls. We're going to go to the wildflower loop. We're going to do about six miles. And we're going to pretend for today that the weather is supposed to be nice the whole day. It's going to be sunny and 68, the perfect day to go hiking. So let's see what I've got in the bag. And now, like I said, this is a gear bag that I would use. Uh, this backpack is my son's, it's not mine, but it is a nice one. And so I may steal it from him. Um, but I'm going to go through and I've got everything in one pocket. Um, so that way it just makes it easier. But normally I would distribute this out to be more organized in the pack. But for demonstration purposes, let's just show you what's in the bag. All right, so, well here, let's start with the outside. On the outside, I've got an extra carabiner. These guys are handy. Um, they come in handy for all kinds of things. And this was a gift from one of my Boy Scouts when I was a scout leader. Um, the reason why I keep this hooked to the back of my bag, um, whether it's this one or any other backpack I use, is because this is about eight foot of cordage uh, when you take it apart. Plus, this one that he gave me is really cool. It's got a flint and steel in the, in the hasp. It's got a little, a uh, very rudimentary compass in there, and it's got an emergency whistle on the front side right here. So there's some pretty cool aspects to this that you can just keep uh, and have on hand if you need it in an emergency situation. So I just usually clip that to the outside just to have it. It doesn't weigh hardly anything. And before we get into the pack, one thing I will tell you about packs uh, and gear is the lighter you go, usually the more expensive it is. So whenever you get gear, when you get packs or equipment, 
try to get things that are the best that you can afford at the time. Don't go out and spend a whole bunch of money just to be able to go out on a day hike. A day hike should not cost you $300 in equipment. Um, but because I do a lot of, of um, guided hikes and hikes here through work, you know, I, I, I spend a little, probably a little bit more than I should have. But let's get into the bag and see what's in here. So the first thing I've got, this is something that I keep with me. This is something I made. This is a field notebook. And in it, I've got my notepad where I've taken some notes on things that I've seen while I've been out on the trail. Uh, and I also keep in here, uh, it's a cover for my tree identification guide. That's one of the fun things I like to do is go out and identify trees. So I keep that in here so I can take notes and write things down. Got a pen on the side, handy rubber band. So I always have that in my pack. I wouldn't call that one of the 10 essentials, but I bring it anyway. So. Next here. We talked about cordage. I almost always have a little bit of extra paracord or some type of small rope in there. Very handy to use. Um, you know, it can be used for several things uh, in first aid situations or if you um, needed to set your pack down for a little bit and the pack was, or the ground was wet, let's say it had just rained the day before, you can take this little carabiner, you can tie a couple of knots in this thing and now you've got something that you can hang your pack up on a tree so your pack's not sitting on the ground getting all wet. Always handy, this stuff is great stuff. It's good to have around. So keep a little bit of that extra in your bag. Leave No Trace card has a reminder of all seven principles on there. You can get these on the Leave No Trace website. They cost about, I think it's, uh, you can get a pack of 25 for a couple dollars. It's pretty cheap. So if you got a group of, of kids that you want to teach this to, or you want to just have give them this to have in their pack as a reminder of things they're supposed to be doing, uh, it weighs next to nothing, and I just keep it slipped in the pack. Next, a bandana or a cloth of some sort. This was a very cool one that was a gift from one of our friends over at the forestry department. It's got Smokey the Bear on it. Um, one of the reasons why I like this, though, is that it is bright colored. So if I had to signal somebody, if somebody you know was looking for me and I'm waving around this yellow thing in there, and I've also got these orange markings on my pack, it's a good way to be spotted if you had to be. So... And not only that, if you had to wipe your brow, always a good thing to have those around. So an extra piece of cloth, a little small towel, a bandana, something like that, good stuff to have in your bag. All right, rain gear. This would be one of the 10 essentials, but this is where I depart a little bit from some of the, the conventional thought. I am not a small person, as you can see by what's in the, in the frame right here. Um, I have yet to find a rain poncho that fits me well and covers me well. Not only that, I have a very large head. So, you know, those holes in the top of the, of the ponchos, you know, I'm squeezing this thing over my head and it's awful. So what I have found is a good size hefty trash bag with a couple of holes cut in it for my arms and one good size one for this giant noggin I got right here works great as a rain poncho. It's big enough that my pack will fit under it on my back. It covers me for the most part. And if I end up not using it, if the weather's nice, like it is on this uh, fictional day at Swart Springs, it's also a great bag that if I needed to pick up somebody else's trash that they left behind, I've got bags to put it in. A couple of trash bags, never a bad thing to have in your day pack. Ah, uh, here's one that I absolutely love and I wish more people would learn to use. This is just a simple compass and this is a map of short springs. All right, so this is where we're going for this fictional hike. And I've got a compass in here in case I had to orient this map. I did an orienteering class not too long ago, uh, I guess it was last year, uh, had a lot of, of great turnout for that. A lot of adults and a lot of kids came out and learned how to use a map and compass. We set up a compass course, uh, taught them how to read a map, how to do topographical maps. Map reading and using a compass is a lost art and I, can't, I cannot recommend enough to learn a rudimentary knowledge of how to use this stuff. Um, some of my uh, some of my younger students that I've had said, "Well, you know, I've got a smartphone. What do I need a map and compass for? All I got to do is turn on my GPS." My answer to that every time is, "Maps don't need batteries. It's always a good thing to know um, how to read one of these and um, at least have a basic knowledge of it. And it's good to have these, especially if you're going to go out in the woods." So I mentioned we we're gonna go on the Adams Falls Trail. If you can see this on here, this goes a pretty good ways back. Now, Short Springs is not really isolated. Um, so it's difficult, it's not impossible, but it's difficult to get lost out there. But I would feel better having one of these in my bag telling me where I was and what I, where I was going than if I didn't. Plus, if my phone battery dies, 
I don't need the GPS in here, I've got this. Maybe we'll do a, a video on how to use Map and Compass. If you think that's a good idea, let me know in the comments and maybe we'll do one of those next time. So, Map and Compass, one of the 10 essentials that you should have in your bag when you go. What else we got in here? Aha! Emergencies always happen. It always happens when you least expect it, so it's better to be prepared for it. This is my personal first aid kit, as you can see from the wear on it. It has seen a lot of miles. Um, but I keep this with me on a daily basis, not just when I go on a hike. Keep this in my bag. It's got some basic stuff in here. Um, obviously, it needs to be organized a little bit better. Uh, EpiPen, which, you know, I got for myself. But, you know, if I ever had to use it on somebody else. Uh, ointment, band-aids, alcohol pads, all kinds of cool stuff. This one's probably a little more elaborate. A personal first aid kit does not really need to have all of the things in it that I've got right here. Um, a few band-aids, uh, especially for a day hike. A few band-aids, uh, maybe an alcohol pad if you need it, some mole skin for blisters, things to treat your feet. Um, remember, your feet is, is the point of contact for six miles with the ground, so you want to take care of your feet. And we'll talk more about that when I get deeper into the bag. Um, but a good first aid kit will have things like that in it. This one's a little more stout because I carry things um, for groups when we go out hiking, um, and I like to be a little bit more prepared for that. If the group is going to be a big group, now that's my personal first aid kit, but this is the group one I bring for bigger groups. It fits nicely in the bottom of the bag. This is an old fish and tackle bag, so you can use just about anything. But it's got a little bit deeper stuff in it, um, you know, in the event of an emergency. And one of the things it has in here, if I can dig it out, but I highly recommend, you can have all the stuff in the world in your first aid kit. However, if you don't know how to use it, it's not going to do you any good. This is my old Boy Scout first aid merit badge manual, and it ha and you can see it's gotten wet a few times. It's got all kinds of great information in it. Um, there are several first aid manuals out there. The Red Cross does one. Um, there's a wilderness first aid manual that's smaller than this. This is just the one that I keep in here just in case. Oh, and I do have my wilderness first aid one in here. Um, I keep these in the bag just in case I come across something. I can't remember everything. Um, so having these for reminders or severe issues, good thing to have. So learn how to use this stuff, especially when you carry it. So big first aid kit for large groups little first aid kit for myself personally. And another note on that before we move on to the rest of the bag, the reason why I carry such a large first aid kit, um, even in my personal stuff, is because I'm not just carrying it for myself. Um, you come across people on the trail pretty frequently that are not prepared, like you might be, um, that need band-aids, moleskin, um, they've cut themselves on something and they're bleeding pretty bad and if you've got the stuff to help somebody that's going to make you an awesome person and they're going to love you on the trail for that. So if you get a first aid kit build it for yourself but have some others in mind just in case. This is my big one that's my little one depending on how big of a group that's what I bring. Next thing in the bag oh you have to be able to cut stuff. Now any young users that are watching this out there right now, or young watchers, I want you to know that knives are not something that you play with. This is not something that you use to throw and try and stick it in a tree or anything. These are tools. This is a straight knife, and then this is the one that I carry on me all the time. This is a folding knife. They both do the same thing, and they are both just as good, just two different methods of using them. You can see they both have a serrated and a straight edge. Um, they're both very durable knives. Um, I happen to like SOG, but I'm not endorsing any particular company. Any pocket knife is a good knife. But remember, young, young watchers, these are tools, not toys. Um, same when we get to the fire starting kit that I've got in here. Remember, don't use these without adult supervision. Even some adults probably need more adult supervision. But be very careful with knives. You can get hurt with these if you use them improperly. So I usually carry this one in my pack, but I almost always have this guy on my belt. Um, used him for a lot of years. So having knives is a good thing to have, but remember they are tools, not toys. Got to have light. If you get stuck out there, even on a day trip, don't underestimate using one of these. Um, I'll give you an example. I had a, uh, a hiker that was on a group uh, trip with me that had fallen, um, didn't get injured, but ended up getting a pretty nasty splinter 
Um, I had tweezers and stuff in my first aid kit, so we got him all taken care of and patched up, but he kept saying he still felt something in there. Well, when I turned on this light, this is a particularly bright one, I was able to shine it down on where that was and find an extra splinter that was very small that we couldn't see, but it was in a very sensitive spot on his hand and it kept bothering him. So the light helped us with that. So even during the day, flashlights can help, but if you get stuck out there at night, you want to have a flashlight. Being able to see is definitely a good thing at night. So keep a good flashlight with you. This is an extra that I carry. I use a Leatherman for all kinds of things. Um, it's a little bit duplicated. I have, uh, this has knife blades and stuff on it, but having an extra pair of pliers sometimes is a good thing to have. Um, so I just keep that in my bag. It's heavy, you know, so I sacrifice a little bit of weight, um, extra weight that I carry with it, but it's worth it to have something like that in your bag. There are smaller ones, much lighter ones. I keep some extra Ziploc bags in case I need some, to waterproof something. Uh, if we get a pop-up shower that I wasn't expecting, um, it's good to have these stick wallet, phone, keys in, that kind of stuff to keep them dry. So a couple extra Ziplocs are a good thing. This is a waterproof bag. Um, I just keep it in there because it doesn't weigh hardly anything, but in it, I keep my fire starting kit. In this kit, I have a flint and steel, a lighter, a wet fire uh, tablet, some matches, birthday candles. You know why you keep birthday candles in a fire starting kit? If you ever been in a slightly windy situation and tried to light a match, matches will blow out on you left and right. But if you can light a match and get a birthday candle lit, that birthday candle will stay lit a lot longer than you think. So I keep a couple of them in there in case it's windy and I did need to use it as a match. A little bit of dryer lint, you're gonna laugh, but I got dryer lint in here in a little bag that's an excellent fire starter. It's some of the best tinder you can ever get is that stuff you scrape out of the bottom of your dryer. Um, it's full of your hair and lint and all that stuff, but hey, it burns. So put it in your fire kit. And this is a little waterproof case that I got probably at Walmart or Dunham's. It was about eight bucks, um, but it keeps all my fire starting stuff dry. And if I ever had to start an emergency fire, I've got everything I need in one little handy bag. It's waterproof here. And I just keep it in there for an extra layer of waterproofing. Fire starting kit. Remember, young viewers, these are not toys. Anytime that you get around anything with fire, make sure that you have an adult supervising and making sure that you're doing this safely. All right, and then they'll teach you how to use it properly so that way nobody gets hurt. So fire starting kit, always a good thing to have. It doesn't have to be this elaborate either. Uh, you can get just a book of matches or a lighter that you carry with you. This is just the one that I use for camping and it's just as easy to throw the whole thing in my bag as to pick out one or two items. So next in the bag, one of the 10 essentials. A water bottle. You can see this one's well used too. One of the things I like about this, and I'm not necessarily endorsing Nalgene, but I like Nalgene bottles for a couple of reasons. The lid seals really good. I have never had, I'm not saying that they never have, but I have never had a Nalgene bottle leak on me. And I can also keep track of how much water I'm drinking. Um, it's got the measurements here on the side. They're starting to get a little worn off, but I know how much water I need to take in on a hike, um, whether it's overnight or just a day hike. And so I can look and see if I'm three miles in and I've only drank four ounces of water, I'm not drinking enough water. I need to get down a little further in the bottle. So full water bottle, I like it with the measurements on the side and a top that doesn't leak, but any water bottle is a good water bottle when you're thirsty. So get one, these are good. One of the 10 essentials. Extra clothes. All right, so one of the 10 essentials that most places will tell you you need is extra clothing. So I am not a big proponent of carrying a full change of clothes. So what I keep in here, why, just a hand towel, kind of like what that bandana was, but this is a more absorbent like cotton towel. I keep an extra pair of socks. Hey, there's my 93.9 The Duck shirt. Those guys are great. We appreciate their support. Thank you, Duck, and The Rooster and Whiskey Country Radio. Um, but I keep an extra pair of socks in my bag um, because I am miserable when my feet get wet. So I put in a large Ziploc bag, extra socks, something to dry my feet with, and an extra shirt just in case. But I can tell you I would rarely use the extra shirt, but I have used extra socks on a hiking trip more than once. And I'll cover that when we get into um, the first episode where we cover the principles. Um, I'll talk some more about the reason why extra socks and things like that are important. 
in your think and plan ahead preparation. So extra clothes, you can bring a whole change, but that's all I carry. Everybody should know what that is. This is a small roll of duct tape. Um, this isn't one of the 10 essentials, but I tell you what, I have gone through more of these little rolls of duct tape on trips. I had a young man that was hiking with me that the whole sole of his shoe came off while we were hiking. When we made it to the end of the trail, the duct tape job that we did putting his shoe back together got him all the way through the end. Um, this little strip of duct tape right here, it can waterproof things, it can act as a band-aid if you had to. Um, you know, there's that old joke about WD-40 and duct tape are the only two things you'll ever need. Well, I don't keep WD-40 in here, but duct tape, a little roll like this, great thing to have. We're getting down to the end here. We're just about through. Sun protection. Now, this is not deodorant. This is a roll-on sunscreen, but even more, this is good stuff. Don't get me wrong. Any sunscreen is good sunscreen. Um, not necessarily this particular brand, but I like anything above SPF 50 um, for hiking and outdoor trips. This stuff is pretty good, but if you don't have this, that's okay. But there are two pieces of equipment for sun protection that you should absolutely have, even if you don't always wear them. Hat and sunglasses. This hat has been well loved and well hiked in from Montgomery Bell State Park. We'd like to thank all of our state park guys and girls uh, out there who do a great job in our 56 state parks here in Tennessee. We appreciate all that they do. Um, but all hats are not created equal for sun protection. So you can see on the back here, and I apologize, this is a little dirty, but um, it's vented. And that's really nice in hot weather, but it is not so good in direct sun. So if you go hiking someplace where the sun is shining directly on your head, this will help, but it's not going to be the best thing. You're still gonna get a little sunburnt, especially me with a little bit less hair on top of my head um, if you wear this kind. Now this kind of hat is a full crown, it's got cloth covering on the back, it's a little bit hotter, but it definitely keeps my bald spot from burning. So this is a good, this is a good type of hat to have, it happens to also be my Leave No Trace hat. And these vented ones are good too. So each one has its pros and cons, um, so just choose for where you're going to hike and where your weather, where your, uh, weather is going to get you. Sunglasses, any sunglasses are better than no sunglasses. Um, this is my pair that I wear pretty much all the time, but especially when I go out hiking, eye protection is important stuff. Um, it's good in cold weather, warm weather. Um, always good to have a pair of sunglasses on. Help keep the glare down. Good for sun protection, so consider keeping those with you, even if you don't wear them all the time. The last thing I have in here, I think this is the last thing it is. So now this is going to be covered more in uh, principle number three about dispose of waste properly. But if you even on a day hike, sometimes depending on where you go, this might be necessary. Now bathrooms are not always readily available in the woods. Um, for guys, it's easy. Ladies, it's not always. Um, and we'll cover more of that in, in the episode about principle number three. But there will be occasion where you're going to need to have this little trowel with you. Um, they call them cat holes. Um, and basically you dig your own bathroom. Um, I don't always carry this one with me on a day hike. On a six mile hike, I think I'm pretty good, but if I was gonna go for longer than that, or if I know I'm gonna be out there all day, even though it's got this one's, there's lighter ones, but this is the one that I have. Um, even though it's got some weight to it, it would be worth it to carry, uh, especially if you're following the principles of leave no trace and you do have to dig a hole for a restroom. It's good to have one of these with you, and if somebody is with you that needs to use the restroom, they will thank you for having this. And there is one more item that I have in my bag that goes along with this. And I think it's in a different pocket. Let's see which pocket it ended up in. So why this never makes it to the tent? Oh, I'm sorry, there's two items. Let me back that phrase up. Some day food. I am not a small guy, again, as you can evidence by the belly in the photo. Just a bag of basic snacks, um, granola bars, crackers, just something to get you through the day. You can go a long time without food. Now you may not think you can, but you can. You can't go a long time without water, but food, you can last a while. So a day hike, you're gonna be fine. But if you just wanna throw in some trail mix or something that you like, um, that you can snack on along the way, something that has minimal trash, these uh, Ziplocs will also double as a trash bag. And I wanna point out here in the bottom, these hard candies, there's a reason for those. I started throwing the, a couple of these in my bag when I was on a trip and found there was a uh, person with us who was diabetic and I did not know it. 
um, they were not a responsible diabetic and uh, sugar bottomed out while we were on a hike about four miles from anything that would remotely get him help. Um, one of the other hikers had a butterscotch addiction, I guess you'd call it, and happened to have some with him. And so that butterscotch, you know, he gave it to the, to the gentleman who was diabetic, um, got his sugar back right enough to get him back to the car and get him to his insulin where he needed it. Um, I keep a few of these now just in case for uh, it was just from experience that I saw that. So in my food bag, I'll throw a couple of hard candies, something that's got a sugar content that if somebody needed it really fast, you've got one right here. This could be a lifesaver. And I don't mean lifesaver candy, I mean just a lifesaver in general. So not a bad thing to keep a couple of those in your bag. But the last thing I wanted to show you, may have migrated to another pocket. This is a big bag. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the bag here in just a moment. Well, there was a Ziploc bag in here that had a small amount of toilet paper. Now I realize that in today's climate where toilet paper shortages are what they are, um, that may not be the easiest thing to do. But another thing that will make you a savior on a group hike is that if you have a little Ziploc baggie like this with about three yards of toilet paper in it, um, this also acts as your pack out bag for that toilet paper. Um, we don't want you burying it and leaving it out there. And I realize that may sound gross, but pack it in, pack it out. And we'll talk more about that in a later principle. But having a little bit of toilet paper with you, and I'm ashamed that I do not have it here to show you, but having some of that with you will make you a hero on a hike. The pack itself, really cool. It's got lots of pockets. It's got this nice vented back on it. It's called a kickstand bag, so when it is full and weighted in the front, it will stand up so it doesn't have to lay on the ground. Um, this one is made by Osprey. Again, I'm not endorsing any brands, but this brand is a, a pretty good one for, for backpacks. Um, but any backpack will work. Um, I know that seems like a lot, but altogether, this bag, even with all that in it and my large first aid kit, only weighs about three and a half pounds. Now, that may seem like a lot, but for a day hike, I would rather carry three and a half pounds of extra things that I may not need than come across a situation where I need it and don't have it. So that's what I have in my bag. If you go hiking with me and you need any of this stuff, if I've got my bag with me, you know what I've got, and I'll be glad to help you out. If you want to make up your bag, send me a list. I'll be glad to tell you if there's something in there that you need or that you don't need. And also you want to try to look for things that have multiple use. Um, things that can be used for more than one thing are definitely worth the extra weight in your bag. And that's what I have in my bag when I go on a day hike. One of the other items that I didn't cover in the uh, video about my pack, uh, but you probably saw the whole time that I was going through it, is my watch. Uh, I highly recommend, and part of your 10 essentials being a watch with hands on it. Um, there's a couple of different reasons for that. Uh, number one is this one uh, glows in the dark and it is powered, um, also the battery is recharged by the sun, uh, which is great and it uses the hands for that. There's other watches that do that too, that have the panel in the back like this one does. The other thing is, and maybe I'll show this if I do the map and compass uh, video, is you can also use your watch as a compass. Uh, if you don't have a compass and you get out there and you can't find your way, you can use your watch, and I can show you a method on how to do that in a later video um, that will at least get you knowing what direction you are heading in. Um, it uses the sun, so you do need a little bit of a clear day to use it or a general idea where the sun is. But we can go into that in another video. in your arsenal of equipment on a hike is a good walking stick. These are a couple examples of my personal sticks here and I also have a set of trek poles that I use occasionally but my preference is a good standard wooden stick. This one here is a little bit fancier as you can see it's got all the little medallions that I've collected over time and if you have a young hiker at home or someone who's interested in it this is a good way to get them involved in it. I will warn you these are a little bit expensive they go anywhere from five to ten dollars but I try to get one just about every place that I go on a hike. It may interest some younger hikers and little hikers in going if there's a medallion for them at the end to put on their walking stick. Um, this is one that I use um, more for show rather than functionality. But a couple things I do want to point out on it, it does have uh, a paracord wrapped handle 
that comes off. There's about um, 20 feet of cord on here. So if I ever needed extra cordage in an emergency situation, I can always take the handle apart on this. Um, it's got a clip for hanging things on. On this one, I have a whistle. Um, they're also good in case, you know, in an emergency situation, if you had to reach to somebody who was stuck, a, you know, maybe out in the water or something like that, you can use it to reach out. And another rule of thumb that I have on my hiking sticks is about chin high is as tall as they go. Anything that's way up here or big and bulky like that is just really not going to help you very much. So right around chin high, maybe eye height and lower is a good rule of thumb on walking sticks. This one here is a little more rudimentary. I will add a wrapped handle to it eventually, but this is the more practical stick. It's straight, um, has some cool little um, features on here, little dots that I added to be able to measure things. Like if I caught a fish and wonder how long it was, I can measure the length of saplings or branches. These are about three inches apart. Rubber stopper on the end, this is very basic, and you can get them at just about any outdoor store or outdoor supply. But a good walking stick is definitely something you wanna have in your pack. No, I don't think there's anything else I forgot. But if you're serious about increasing your knowledge of things outdoors, I highly recommend building your reference library, whether it's online or in print. Myself, I prefer books, and as you can see here on the table, I have several books that I use um, for all different sorts of hikes and things that I do. Uh, I probably have more than the average person just because I lead some of these interpretive hikes and I also teach these Leave No Trace classes. I get asked a lot of questions and I can't remember everything. This big head doesn't hold all the information. So I keep these reference books in case I ever have to go back and refer to anything and answer questions that I don't know the answer to. One thing I will recommend though is that in your pack, if you're going to take these, take the one that's specific for the day, for the event that you're going to do. These books get heavy over time and the whole table full like what I've got here is going to weigh your pack down and by the end of a day hike you're going to be pretty tired. So be selective. If you're going to take a book with you, take the one that you're going to specifically use. But an alternative is while you're out there, use that smartphone and take pictures. You can always use your pictures to go back into the reference books when you get home and check out and see if you can identify what you saw. That concludes today's episode. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have questions about anything that you saw today, or if you have comments about future videos you'd like to see us do, please let us know in the comments below. Until next time, practice leave no trace, and we'll be back with our next episode on principle number one, think and plan ahead. We'll see you then.